Question 14. Why was Curse of the Blood Elf such a short campaign? It was more planned for it. No. <laughs> uh, so it was short because... Um, so keep in mind that Reign of Chaos was a game that was five years in development. And I'd say a good year and a half of that, if not two years, was the campaign being made. From the storyline to the tools, the editor, to the actual campaign itself. So... Um, that took two years. We had a good understanding of the tools, but now keep in mind, Reign of Chaos finishes and releases. Everyone's brain is fried. We all go on vacation for like at least a month. The Frozen Throne production starts immediately upon your return. People are still like chilling from their vacation. Things are moving slowly. Basically, we were like, we have one year to do the expansion. That was always sort of the, <clears throat> this is what's going to happen. But really, it was more like nine months because people just were it took a, a while to get back into the groove um <clears throat> so at that point what we decided as a team was that if we weren't feeling it we would just cut it and i think a large part of that was that um tim wanted to spend more time on the duratar campaign uh the for the orcs which we were not going to have an orc mission at all so we have to move that time around somewhere right so if we're doing an orc mission if we're doing an orc campaign when we weren't going to do one then let's take a little bit from the blood elf campaign which it, it had a lot of cool missions and stuff but the story was kind of told pretty, pretty quick it didn't it didn't need as many missions maybe as as others would <laughs> i'm gonna put because we wanted orc stuff i think that works uh but tim could tell you more about that What's the story behind the founding of Duratar? Why was it made into an RPG-style campaign? Who was behind its creation? And did you have a part in its design and creation? Um, Tim Campbell, 100%. And if you don't know who Tim Campbell is, I will show you. Frost Giant Studios. Tim Campbell is one of the co-founders of Frost Giant Studios, and he was largely responsible for many of the cool things that you saw in the founding of Duratar. Uh, in fact, without him, that campaign mission the orcs having a campaign at all never would have happened. So uh, if you'd all do me a favor and go to frostgiant.com and subscribe, uh, I'm sure he'd appreciate it and I'd appreciate it too. Um, and then if you want to see who Tim Campbell is, here he is. Tim Campbell, game director and president, former game director of Wasteland 3, lead campaign. See, I've worked with him on Wasteland 3 too, so we, we go back a ways. Um, but yeah, campaign designer of Warcraft 3 The Frozen 3. Uh, there you go. Now you know. Did you actually use the world editor to make the missions? How was it different as a program back then? Yes, 100% we used the world editor to make all the campaign missions uh, with very little deviation from what you guys got at the end, except that our tools were incomplete. So at the time of making Reign of Chaos, um, there were things that we just didn't have. Uh, and we sort of had to make hacks to work around it or just figure it out or just skip that content and do something else um so that that it could be quite frustrating when we we're making the campaign but ultimately we were making the campaign editor the the map editor for release and we wanted the campaign editor that we made the campaign with to be the thing that people got and could use the only thing i'm disappointed in is that we locked all the campaign maps because i think um there was no reason to do that other than size constraints because it had to fit on a disc. So we had compression. So maybe that was the reason, but it would have been nice if after the fact we had released them. Uh, and I think now you can just go and open them. Uh, but though in my case, I had to rely on another tool to do that. Um, but yeah, the trigger editor, the triggers and all that are exactly the same thing that you guys have. Uh, we didn't, do anything different except on two missions there are cases where uh, programmers actually had to go in and because we wanted to do something so complicated that the trigger editor couldn't handle it or it would choke the cpu or gpu it would cause problems um <clears throat> so in those cases they would uh, in those two cases that i remember they would edit it um in direct uh code uh, and that was Mike Morheim edited um, Calling of Stratholm. There's a couple triggers there that he turned into actual code. And I believe Michael Heiberg edited one of his missions uh, that had a moving wagon. Uh, I can't remember which one that was. 
Oh yeah, that's the culling. Hello, culling, my old friend. Oh, the memories. It's been so long. Oh, right. I wanted to show you where the triggers have been edited. Oh, man. Oh, the pain. The waterfalls. So important. And it's in here. It's gotta be. Yeah. Look at that. So you can see here uh, that this is code. That's Those aren't triggers. These are triggers. This is code. So when Mike Morheim was uh, fixing fixing my map, see, <laughs> it, I made my map so complicated that the president of the company had to come and, and go back to coding <laughs> to fix it. Uh, anyways, if you open up the Culling of Stratholm, you can see where um, actual code was used to um, make things work. I literally can't read this. I never understood what he did. Um, but, you know, all the triggers stuff that was my stuff and then when he was fixing it he was like eh, let's just do it <laughs> in code and if you can do that great what you got at release was better than what we had when we were making the campaign think about that did you make the cutscenes in the missions or was that a different set of dev developers yes i did i did a lot of them so let's open the cinematics. So one thing with the cinematics was that about halfway through development, uh, Mike Hybert came up with like a template for cinematics that helped a lot, made it easier because the main thing was like, um, let me find the most famous cinematic of all time. To make our cinematics skippable, we had to account for all the things that could happen during the cinematic that we wanted to maintain. So every cinematic has a cancel set of triggers that, that has to be there. This is me creating groups of units for the cinematic so that they all move together and do things. If you watched my live stream a little while back, you'll see where I edited this already. So this is actually slightly different than the original uh, calling, but it's just mostly to improve little elements of it because I wanted to fix some of the camera angles. But yeah, I would go in, uh, I would uh, place cameras, um, and then one of the best tricks to do is every you just want that camera to be constantly moving to give that feeling of motion throughout. And so uh, otherwise it's just two stagnant characters talking at each other. And you can do little head movements and slight animations and stuff, but that feeling of movement from the camera panning around and, and moving from position to position to sort of give it more ambiance and, and character, it's really important and something that unfortunately was missing in Reforged. But yeah, I did a lot of cinematics and I was really into these. Um, I think I fancied myself a, a, a director <laughs> at some point in my life. And what was so fun about the, the, the cinematic stuff was that you were basically making a movie. And uh, you know, at the time that kind of blew my mind. Um, because I had complete control over all the actors and stuff. Yeah, the script was already done, so I wasn't doing anything with that. But you'll see that I had a few Easter eggs where I took some creative license and, and uh, took some voice lines that weren't necessarily supposed to be <laughs> intended for those the purposes that I used them for. Oh, later in development, the artists actually did come in and do some of the cinematics. And they also gave me a book on cinematography where I learned about how you're not supposed to flip the camera more than 180 degrees, which I did in the culling of Strath, uh, the opening cinematic. How was working on Frozen Throne levels different from working on Random Chaos ones? Uh, it was a lot faster paced, I'll say that. Um, but also, we knew the tools at this point, so uh, we just sort of knew what we were doing and uh, things came together a lot quicker. So we would have playable missions long, like rapidly, way before we would on the Reign of Chaos uh, missions. And that's probably why Tim invested so much time into the founding of Durotar um, campaign mission and making it that different styles because he realized like, oh, we can do all these things. So let's, let's show what we can do. It was faster paced, um, but easier overall and that just comes from knowledge the more you know the tools the easier it is to use them can you please show us where exactly the secret units locations are on the screen during thrall's vision cinematic it is said that there's a hydralisk somewhere in there and other secret units but i personally cannot spot them thrall's 
vision cinematic. Am I going to get copyright strike for this? I don't remember there being an eye in here, but it sounds like something they would. Uh, oh, it's when they come rolling over the hill, isn't it? Past I think I know where it is. Scar the land by conflict. Mm, conflict. There we go. It's coming. Crow eye. I mean, you could have anything in the background there. You would. There could be a hundred hydrolysts. There's no way we find this. <laughs> I do recall there being a uh, hydralisk in the background of one of these scenes, but I wasn't there for it. This is something the cinematics department would have to answer. But as I recall, I think it's here. But how would you ever even spot it at this resolution? It's impossible. It might be that, actually. It just looks like a rock. Uh... No, I can't. <laughs> I'm going to have to... So, someone else is going to have to answer that one. Why is the Scourge of Lordaeron the only campaign to feature epilogue text on the last level? Ah, so the reason for that is that it was confusing. The confusion came from um, people were like, Hey, I just got Frostmore and now I'm ready to come home and save my my town and then Arthas murders his dad spoilers <laughs> uh, so it felt uh, some people felt that there was a little bit more explanation needed and because it was sort of the epic of Arthas or at least his human life um, it needed a little bit more of a transition than it got because it wasn't clear necessarily from the cinematic what was going on in his or what had happened to him because you just got the sword and yeah you did some crazy stuff all along the way but it needed a little bit more than that so after taking his vengeance upon Melganus, prince arthas wandered off into the frozen wastelands of northrend tormented by frostmourne's maddening voice arthas lost the last vestiges of his sanity kind of a cop-out in my opinion now driven by the sword's dark will arthas plans to return home to Lord Lordaeron and claim his just reward. So, <clears throat> yeah. Basically, it was that the transition between the end of the mission without the epilogue text and the cinematic was a little too harsh. So we came up with this. or Someone did. And it was implemented in the map editor. So you can do your own epilogue text yourself. In By Demons Be Driven, there's an unused troll witch doctor named Miljanza. Do you remember what his original purpose was? Well, no. So let's go look. Man, if you had any idea how slow these things loaded back in the day, I would never be able to do this <laughs> on the machines that we had. Mil Janza. He has no triggers associated with him. He's got a different tint, and he's slightly bigger. He has Sleep, Healing Ward, and Stasis Trap. Looks like he has increased regeneration and much higher max mana. Hmm. This isn't my map. <laughs> Is it? Is it? Did I do this one? I can't remember anymore. Uh, long story short, I have no idea. I don't know why I picked this question. I think I thought I knew who it was and that I would find it when I went to the editor. And I was wrong. Did you have any voice lines in the game? Um, I don't know for sure, but I did do a couple readings, but uh, I don't think they were used. There's the footman who gets killed, but it's like a warning that uh, her dad is there. And I think I did a reading of that line. It's like, Mistress Jaina, your father would be... Ugh. Something like, something along those lines. Mistress Jaina, we found you at last. The Admiral will be... Overjoyed. Uh, and I did try to do a reading for like the ogres and stuff. This way, no that way, that kind of stuff. But uh, I don't think they used anything that I did. I was more on the writing side of things. So the all the blood elf engineer lines are mine. So that's you know that's a claim to fame. Is it an offense to the original developers of Warcraft Three if fans rewrite the game engine into an open source version that can run the maps and models? No. 
totally do that. Do whatever you want, man. Uh, in my opinion, it should all be open source and free. I am not offended, but it would be illegal. <laughs> <laughs> um, beware the eye of Activision. Uh, it's just the sad truth is that uh, we don't do open source stuff anymore. Uh, so, I mean, some ga- some games do, but uh, Blizzard definitely not. All that stuff's proprietary, and if you try to do that kind of stuff, I guess you could reverse engineer it. Yeah, there was a game company in Korea that reverse engineered StarCraft, I want to say, and made their own game. Uh, Kingdoms, Kingdom Under Fire? Something like that. Um, and then uh, Blizzard sued them. Um, because they had like clearly cut copy pasted code <laughs> there was stuff in there that was like straight up one to one like it wasn't reverse engineered at that point and then I think uh, what they ended up doing was they changed their game a little bit so that it didn't use the direct code the interlude unfinished business after balancing the scales takes place somewhere in Ashenvale but it uses Lordaeron summer tile set is this an oversight typically no this is an aesthetic choice and um, in the case of the Frozen Throne, I believe the tile set wasn't done at the time the interlude was being made. Um, and then it just didn't get switched or something. Um, but it might be... Yeah, we didn't have the Ashenvale tile set until pretty late for some reason. Um, but I... So I'm, I'm actually not 100% sure on this one. So it was, it was probably a combination of factors. I think it was that the tile set wasn't finished at the time that the interlude was being made. And two, that there were some aesthetic choices made in it that made it impossible to transition it to the, the Ashenvale tile set later. Um, so in a situation where, like, I guess I could scrap the whole map and start over, we were like, yeah, because <laughs> it's a nine month really development cycle yeah it's one year but really it's nine months Um, when illidan becomes complete in a destiny of flame and sorrow why is his ultimate ability mass teleport probably for a cinematic effect um but let's open a destiny of flame and sorrow and see oh this looks weird did i do this what we want is illidan oh that's the sound editor talk about that another day unit editor where's the object editor yes are you sure about this illidan evil no illidan demon form mass teleport yeah that's been edited fascinating um i believe he cast mass teleport in a cinematic and that's why it's done but let me make sure uh why am I in the object editor then? That would be the trigger. Seder hates you. God. Egg sacks. Oh, alright. I'm being distracted. Looking for cast. You know what it was? Now that I'm thinking about it. Okay. So sometimes we get ideas for uh, if we want to do something. And I think an early idea was that Illidan would transform into demon form and then he would mass teleport away. So the reason that this unit exists is because that idea started and then it didn't come to fruition or we did something else. In the cinematic, I believe he stomps away, but I'd have to like... Assuming he doesn't skip it, he's Korean. They tend to skip cinematics. This is awesome, it's in Korean. So... This definitely seems like it might be one of my cinematics. Except that the cameras aren't continuing to move. Yeah, maybe it's not. So I had a tendency to always have my camera be moving in my cinematics. So I would do it over conjoined lines and duration and stuff. So it would always be slowly moving. Does he mass teleport at the end? No, he just busts through the trees. So the reason that he had mass teleport is because we were thinking he would mass teleport away at the end. And it, we just didn't do it. Instead, we had him bust through the trees because that's a little bit cooler. And that's the answer. And that's it. I've answered, I think, 23 questions. 
<laughs> of the 25 that I picked. I handpicked these, so I feel a little bit dumb about that. But either way, I hope that these answers were satisfactory and that it gave you some sense of closure. If you like and subscribe and you uh, vote this up and you share it around, maybe we can get the attention of some of the other people that I want to talk to and for them to know that there's a platform for certain things that they're doing. Uh, I think would be a big benefit to convincing them that this would be a good idea to to do a 20 years after the fact, ask me anything kind of situation. And we've already got the questions all set up for them, so it should be pretty. I think the convincing is not, not that difficult, but I will make an attempt at that very soon. So I hope you've enjoyed this, and um, I will be looking at the next set of questions to answer up on Ablehawk's channel soon.